scripture, you'll be able to arrive at the third benefit, which is correction. And the word correction there means to reset your mind, which is a function of unlearning so you can relearn. To unlearn the things that are contrary and to learn the things that are correct. For example, without sound doctrine, many years ago, when you read the Bible, you will see things that look like a contradiction. And then I've had people say to me, Dr. Damina, why is it that the Bible is full of contradictions? And I said to them, well, there are no contradictions. The contradictions only exist in your mind. There is a perfect harmony to all of scripture. A perfect harmony to all of scripture. So there are no contradictions. The contradictions are only in your understanding. Like I always use this illustration. The Bible tells us, love not the world neither the things that are in the world if any man love the world the love of the father is not in him then the same bible says for god so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life he just said you love not the world but he himself is loving the world it sounds like a contradiction the Bible also tells us that friendship with the world is enmity with God. A friend of the world is an enemy of God. But the same Bible tells you, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. So you say, I shouldn't be their friend, but you say, I should go and preach to them. That's the way it looks. But when you study the Bible very carefully, you'll find out that the word world, the word world has two different meanings in the original text. The word world is the word cosmos. Then there is another word for world as the word aeons. So there is cosmos and there is aeons. A-I-O-N, aeons. So you have cosmopolitan and you have aeon. Now it is proper study that will bring you to understand that when God says love not the world, he is saying love not the aeons. Aeon means their way of thinking. Their way of thinking. Cosmos means the cosmopolitan we are human beings live so God loves the cosmopolitan he loves mankind but you love not the world's way of thinking neither the things that are in their way of thinking and then if you read further I say for all that is in the world is the loss of the flesh the loss of the eyes and the pride of life which deals with a way of thinking or a way of reasoning which deals with a mindset but it will take proper teaching and explanation to know that the world there means world even though it doesn't mean world it will depend on what context or what what Jesus was talking about when he made those statements the same thing with Bible study when you study the Bible you must always remember that the Bible has a perfect harmony to everything that is said and if anything looks contradictory the contradiction only exists in your understanding are we together on the same page here? So he now says that the scriptures will profit you for doctrine, which is teaching or explanation. That will bring you to reproof, which is evidence. The scriptures are responsible for our persuasion and our evidence. Then evidence will bring you to correction, a resetting of your mind, where you unlearn so you can relearn. And then he says for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect truly furnish unto every good work that the man of God may be perfect so even though he's a man of God he still needs to be perfect he needs to be complete he needs to mature he needs to grow into the fullness of God's purpose for his life and then he becomes furnished unto every good work now please listen carefully in your English Bible the Bible is segmented into two you have the Old Testament and the New Testament and some Sometimes that is where many people stop but the Bible is not just Old and New Testament in two segments if you observe very carefully the Bible tells you the, the, the Bible you have in your hand that the Old Testament began from Genesis but technically the Old Testament did not begin from Genesis the Old Testament did not begin from Genesis the Old Testament started somewhere so where did the Old Testament start from Hebrew Hebrews chapter 8 verse number 6. Hebrews chapter 8 verse number 6. The brother on the computer, I'm going to walk with you now. Hebrews chapter 8 verse number 6. 
Hebrews chapter 8 verse number 6. But now had he obtained a more excellent ministry, talking about Jesus, by how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant which was established upon better promises. Now watch, in the book of Hebrews when you read better, it's not like good, better, best. No. When you see the word better, But where is the fault with that first covenant? Look at the next verse, verse number 8, Hebrews chapter 8 verse 8, Hebrews chapter 8 verse 8, observe, for finding fault with them, not with it, for finding fault with them, not with it. So the fault was not with the covenant. But the covenant found fault with the people to whom it was given. Did you observe that? For finding fault with them, not with it, he saith, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Did you observe that? So God says, I will make a new I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Jude. Observe the next verse. Not according, verse, verse 9, Hebrews 8, 9. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt. So the first covenant started in Exodus chapter 19. When I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt. That was the introduction of the first covenant. Of the first covenant. But God said, you know what? Because the first covenant found fault with the people. I will make a new covenant. So there is first covenant and there is new covenant. Did you get that? There is first covenant and there is new covenant. Are we in the building? 
All right, so God says, I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers, with their fathers, with their fathers, with their fathers, not with them, with their fathers, with them a new covenant, with their fathers. The day I took them out of Egypt. So it seems like there are two covenants. The one that was made with their fathers. And the one I'm going to make with the house of Israel. Which is a new covenant. Stay with me. With their fathers there was a covenant. I will make a new one with the house of Israel but it will not be like the first one not according to the first one which means there is a difference between the old between the first covenant I don't want to use old between the first covenant and the new covenant first new first fathers new with the house of Israel are you here first fathers new with the house of Israel now observe the spirit of the first covenant with the house of Israel when I took with the fathers in the day when I took them by the hand out of the land of Egypt observe the spirit because they continued not in my covenant and I regarded them not saith the Lord first covenant you do I do you don't do I don't do first covenant you draw nigh I draw nigh you don't draw nigh, I don't draw nigh. First covenant, you give, you get. You don't give, you don't get. First covenant, you pay tight, I bless you. You don't pay tight, you are cursed. First covenant, you don't qualify if you don't qualify. First covenant, it shall come to pass if you shall hearken unto the voice of the Lord your God and shall observe to do according to all that is written therein that the blessing shall come on you. So if you don't observe, no blessing. First covenant, but I will make a new covenant. Glory to God. Not according to the first one. So now, what should be bothering you is, does God have two covenants? Because if you say God has two covenants, it means God was a bad boy. Now he has become a good boy. That doesn't sound like God. Because I am the Lord, I change it not. Jesus the same yesterday, today, and forever. So he can be like this here and like this here. Then he's not God because if he is God, he should be consistent. Why? He sees the end from the beginning and the beginning from the end. He does not walk in time. He sat out of time and created time and regulates time. He's not subject to time. Time is subject to him. Am I talking to somebody here? So if he is God, he should be able to ahead of time foresee and plan so that he doesn't change. So the question should be, the first covenant then, who gave it? Because it cannot be God giving two covenants. If I'm teaching, say I hear you. It cannot be God. 
That is why you hear people say the God of the Old Testament is more powerful than the God of the New Testament. But that's not true. Because if God was powerful in the Old Testament and weak in the New Testament, then he's not God. Because if he's God, he should be omnipotent. If he's God, he should, he should live out of time and compress time in his hand. So he can't be the one turning. That's why James will say, there is no shadow of turning. He never changes his mind. God does not repent. You know, sometimes you read the Bible and it says, and God repented. No, no, no. God did not repent. It is, it is their opinion. See, in the Old Testament, when you made a decision that will bring a repercussion, and before you acted on the decision to bring the repercussion, you change your mind. And the repercussion didn't come. They will say God repented. You are not hearing what I'm saying. When you are about to make a decision that will bring a repercussion. But then you change your mind. And the repercussion didn't come. And they didn't know that you didn't make the decision. They thought you made it. But since there was no repercussion, they assumed that God changed his mind. Let me tell you this. In the Bible, God spoke. In the Bible, angels spoke. In the Bible, Satan spoke. In the Bible, evil spirits spoke. In the Bible, angels spoke. In the Bible, liars spoke. In the Bible, thieves spoke. In the Bible, native doctors or what you call sorcerers, they also spoke. So the Bible is like a junkyard. You don't just take everything hook, line, and sinker. That is why Second Timothy says, study to show yourself, approve unto God, a workman that needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So there is a right way of dividing. He didn't say divide. Uh -uh. He said rightly. So if there's a right way, it means that there is a wrong way. He says, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk. If there is sincere milk, it means there is insincere milk. Am I teaching? For example, let me show you something Satan said that many churches are using today, but they don't know where it came from. They are using what Satan said. As something they are claiming from God. But it's Satan that said it. Genesis 3 verse 6. Genesis chapter 3 verse number 6. Put it up for me brother. Genesis chapter 3 verse number 6. During the temptation between Adam, Eve and the serpent. And when the woman saw... Give me from verse, verse, give me from verse 3 so that we can follow the thought, the thought pattern. Genesis 3:3. 3, 3, we read down to verse 6. But of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God had said, You shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. This is Eve talking to Satan. Look at what Satan said to Eve. Next verse. Next verse, verse 4. And the serpent said unto the woman, You shall not surely die. Who said you shall not surely die? Satan. It sounds like a faith confession. You shall not surely die. But that came from Satan. And Satan is a liar. And the father of all liars. And many churches use that for their program. You shall not surely die. And people will be happy to attend. Because it sounds nice. But where is the origin? It's Satan. 
Am I teaching here? You know, Pastor Jane, when we tell people that confessing your sin does not score any point with God, God doesn't need you to confess sin. God needs you to confess Christ. Confessing your sin is of zero value. Because the first person that confessed sin was Adam. And if confessing sin forgives sin, it should have forgiven Adam. Somebody says, where did he confess? Okay, watch, we're reading. Put it up, that Genesis 3, and verse 6. Follow the reading. Verse 6, Genesis 3, 6. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. Next verse, next verse, verse 7. <clears throat> verse 7, Genesis 3, verse 7. And the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed thick leaves together, and made themselves aprons. Next verse. Next verse 8. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Next verse. Look at verse 9 now. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? Next verse. Verse 10. Verse 10. And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden. And I was afraid because I was naked. What is that? Confession. I was afraid. I heard your voice. I was naked. Watch. Next verse. Next verse. Next verse. Verse 11. And he said, Who told thee that thou was naked? Has thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? Next verse. Verse 12. Look at confession. And the man said, The woman whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree and I did eat. What is that? Confession. Did thou forgive the sin? No. Thou did not forgive the sin. He confessed, but he was not free. Sins are not forgiven by confession. Sins are forgiven by death. The wages of sin is death. What is wages? Salary. When you are sinning, you will be paid salary. The salary of sin is death. So if a man really wants to pay for his sin, he should die, not confess. He should die. And then remember, the death of a sinner cannot save a sinner. It has to be the death of the sinless to save the sinner. And since no man was sinless, no man on earth was sinless. God, who is sinless, became a man. Did you hear that? God, who is sinless, became a man to die for the sinful man. It's called the great exchange. He took my place so I can take his place. It is on the premise of that death that sins are forgiven. It is because of the resurrection of Christ that man can become righteous. Not because of performance. Are you still here? Are you still here? Now remember, we are tracing covenants. So if God is consistent, God never changes. Who is responsible for the first covenant? God said, I will make a new one. <laughs> you are still here? Okay. That first covenant, Brother Paul calls it old covenant. He calls it one? Old covenant. I'm going to show you in a minute. Now, come
Come with me to Galatians chapter 3 verse 15. Galatians chapter 3 verse 15. Galatians chapter 3 verse number 15. Hallelujah. Galatians Galatians Brethren, I speak after the manner of men. I speak after the manner of what? Talk to me, Mombasa. Talk to me. I speak after the manner of what? Men. Though it be but a man's covenant. Whose covenant? God's covenant? Whose covenant? So there is man's covenant and there is God's covenant. Though it be but a man's covenant, yet if it be confirmed. Now wait. If you don't read well, you will think he is talking about the man's covenant. No. When he said yet, if it be confirmed, he's no more talking about the man's covenant. If you follow the context, observe, I will show you now. Yet, if it be confirmed, no man disannul it or added there to. Next verse. So you see what he's talking about. Verse 16. Now, what is confirmed and what you cannot add to or disannul to Abraham and his seed where the promises made. Hiya. He saith not and to seeds as of many but as of one and to thy seed which is Christ. Follow, follow, follow. Next verse. Oh, glory to God. 17. And this I see. And this I see. Eh? That the covenant which was confirmed before of God in Christ. There was a covenant confirmed before. Before? Question. Before what? Confirmed before what? Hold. First covenant a new covenant. When did the first covenant start? Huh? Exodus. Exodus. First covenant, Exodus. There was a covenant confirmed before the first. I don't know if you're following. There was a covenant confirmed before the first covenant and that covenant that was confirmed before the first was in Christ. Was where? In Christ. Now it will get clear now. Watch, watch. The law. The law. Which was 400, put up that scripture for me, brother. Which was Galatians 3.17. Galatians 3.17. Just leave it there for now. Before of God in Christ, the law, which was 430 years after after what? After before of God in Christ. After before of God in Christ. The law which was 430 years after 
cannot disannul what the covenant that was made before of God in Christ the law the law which was after or the law which was the first the law which was the first which God decided to make a new covenant after which was in existence before the law I'm playing around with your mind right <laughs> are you still here the law which was 430 years after cannot disannul what the covenant which was of God where in Christ before the law which means the law is the first the law of Moses is the first covenant but before the first there was a covenant of God in Christ which the first cannot annul the first cannot make it of none effect I don't know if I'm talking to somebody here are you getting it now so the law 430 years after cannot neutralize the covenant of God in Christ which is called the promise the covenant of God in Christ is called what the promise because look at it look at it which was 130 years after cannot disannul that it should make what it should make what the promise of none effect you know what he's saying that the law of Moses does not render the promise of God in Christ ineffective so look at me everybody the promise of God in Christ the law after the promise after the law a new covenant the law the first a new covenant before the law the first the promise of God in Christ are you following okay pastors please come four of you first pastor here second pastor here third pastor here fourth pastor here now watch i will use these pastors to explain to you the promise of god in christ the first covenant or what the law the law cannot delete the promise of God in Christ but this promise of God is not called the first covenant and it's not called the old covenant it is called what the promise the law or huh? the first you guys are very intelligent man. the first huh huh after the first which is uh, uh, the law a new covenant a new covenant where God says I will make a new covenant with the house the law or the first was made with the fathers when I brought them out of Egypt because they continued not in my covenant I regarded them not the dispensation of the law of Moses you do I do you don't do I don't do you give you get you don't give you don't get you pay tight I bless you you don't pay tight I curse you the law the fathers a new covenant I go 
God will make a new covenant. Question. Who gave the promise? Say it confidently. Who gave the promise? Who gave the law? Did I tell you Moses? Did we read Moses? What did we read? Though it be but a man's covenant. Whose covenant? So stay there for now. So, first is whose covenant? A man's covenant. What is this? What is it called? The promise. What is this one called? Man's covenant or the first covenant or the law. What about this? The new covenant. Is it getting clear? Which means that the promise is older than the first covenant. The question you now want to ask me is, what is the promise? The promise of a new covenant. Which means, from the beginning, God only said one thing. New covenant in a promise. I make a new covenant. That's all God said. The law. <laughs> a man's covenant cannot disannul that it should make the promise of non-effect. The law cannot stop the promise from coming here. So the law, uh, I mean the promise and the new covenant confirmed together produces the new covenant in his blood. So three of you together go to Pastor Ezekiel. He alone. Watch. The promise overtook him and left him. Met the new covenant consummated in the blood. So the promise, the new covenant consummated becomes what God promised, what God has done. Which means from the beginning God said one thing and he has maintained one thing. Is it clear? Okay, pastors go back. Leave this pastor alone. Is it getting clear? I beg you, is it getting clear? See, if you understand this thing I'm doing tonight, the Bible will become easy for you to understand. Nobody will do you like this with the Bible again. So this is a man's covenant. So let's get back. Galatians 3.17 And this I say, that the covenant that was confirmed before of God in Christ, the law, which was 430 years after, cannot disannul that it should make the promise of non-effect. Next verse. But God gave it to Abraham. Go, go, go to verse 18 quickly. Verse 18, verse 18, verse 18. Galatians 3, 18. For if the inheritance be of the law it is no more of promise ah, you didn't get that if the inheritance that the promise will produce can only be gotten from the law then it is no more of promise If you don't give God, you cannot get. It's a lie. If the inheritance is fulfilled by the law, which is condition that you have to perform, then it is no more of promise. 
not of works it is the gift of God are you following now look at the next verse but God gave it to Abraham how now wait 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 but God gave it to Abraham how eh? so what did God give to Abraham by promise eh? say it very well the inheritance don't be afraid if you fail i will mark you wrong and correct it that's the highest nothing more so don't be afraid just say it if you're wrong i'll tell you wrong don't be afraid to be wrong because sometimes you have to be wrong to be right god gave what to abraham what is the promise what inheritance huh Christ, Christ, Christ. Did Abraham have Christ? Huh? Did Abraham have Christ? Huh? Mombasa. Did Abraham have Christ? No. By faith? He had Christ by faith. He had Christ by promise. He had Christ by promise. Abraham had Christ by promise. Christ by promise is called types and shadows. Somebody says, can you prove it? Yes, wait. Brother, put your finger in Galatians. It's not me now causing you trouble. It's them. Put your finger in Galatians. Flip to Hebrews 11.1. 1. God gave it to Abraham. How? By promise. What did God give to Abraham? Huh? The inheritance. Which inheritance? Christ. Okay. And Abraham had Christ. How? By promise. If you have something by promise, do you have it in substance? Huh? Okay. So now, faith is the substance of what? Things hoped for, the evidence of what? Did Abraham see Christ? But the Bible said, Jesus said, Abraham saw my days. <laughs> Jesus said, Abraham saw my days. So, did Abraham see Christ? Don't be confused. <laughs> Pastor Jane, I will close. I will close this text. <laughs> did Abraham see Christ? Eh? Eh? Now, is the substance of things, the evidence of things, did Abraham see Christ? No. 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 He had a, he had Christ in a promise. I know what is confusing all of you now. <laughs> because I quoted a scripture. Now, do you know that if I say Abraham saw my days. It doesn't mean Abraham saw me. My days is not me. I put that scripture to do you like this. Abraham saw my days, not Abraham saw me. Which means Abraham saw my days as in types and shadows. Abraham didn't see Christ because he's a, they had the evidence of things that were not seen. So that you know Abraham is what we're talking about here is part of this. Look at verse 2. Hebrews 11 verse 2. For by it the elders obtain a good report. Question, which elders? Huh? Okay, look at the elders. Next verse. By faith verse 3 
through faith we understand that the walls were framed by the word of God so that things which are seen were not made of things which do not fear. Verse 4. Verse 4. Can we read verse 4 together? Everybody want to go? By faith, Abel. So Abel is one of the elders, not my Abel. The one that Cain killed. Abel is one of the elders who had the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Now observe, look at this. By faith, Abel, I may deal with this tomorrow. By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous. God testifying of his gifts and by it he being dead yet speaketh who being dead eh? talk to me who being dead no he can't be Abel now he cannot be Abel look at it look are you looking look by faith Abel over and unto God what a more excellent sacrifice than Cain by which which what by the offering by the offering which Abel offered the offering the offering being dead yet speaketh not Abel being dead but the offering what was the offering of Abel lamb lamb Behold, the Lamb of God. So that Lamb, dead, speaketh. That's why today the blood of Jesus speaketh. So the, the blood that spoke was not Abel's blood. Is Jesus' blood speaking. That is why it was his offering, which was a type of Jesus. I'm teaching good. Now follow. Next verse. Give me verse 5. By faith, Enoch. Give me verse 7. Verse 7. Hebrews 11, 7. You help me read verse 7. Hebrews 11, 7. Want to go? By faith. Those are the elders. Not elders of your church. Elders of the Bible. <laughs> Look at the next one. Verse 8. By faith. By faith. Who did God give the promise to? Who got the inheritance? How did he get the inheritance? By the law or without the law? Huh? Huh? Okay. The law is what? Man's covenant. The law is what? It is also called first covenant. What operated before the first? The promise. So without the law, God gave to Abraham the inheritance of the promise. So the question will be, what is the inheritance? Because if you don't answer the inheritance, that is where there are loose ends for prosperity preachers and materialistic preachers to tell you that Abraham got an inheritance of cattle. <laughs> but that's not true. The inheritance here that Abraham got without the law, listen carefully, is justification without works. The law is works. The promise does not need works. Listen carefully. Stay with me, man of God. Stay with me. Listen carefully. Ah, are you ready? I want to drop something. Are you ready? You and God don't have a covenant. Yes. You don't have a covenant. You and God don't have a covenant. That is why he called it the promise. He didn't say God gave Abraham covenant. But God gave Abraham promise. 
not a covenant. The word promise is epangelia in the Greek. Epangelia means a self-fulfilling promise. That is, I promise you, I don't need you to fulfill it. I that promise, I will fulfill it without your involvement. That's why I didn't call it covenant, he called it promise. Because what is a covenant? A pledge, a vow, an agreement between two or three parties to carry out terms. That's a covenant. That's why each party will have a lawyer. And each lawyer will represent the interests of his client. Because there are terms. And if you break, there's punishment. That's, that's a covenant. God and you cannot have covenant. Because God is immortal. You are mortal. Immortality and mortality cannot be in a covenant. Mortality will fail. Immortality never fails. So before the covenant starts, you will even be punished. Because you will break everything. Am I talking to somebody here? So you and God don't have a covenant. What you have is the promise of God. Standing on the promises of Christ my King Through eternal ages let his praises ring Glory in the highest I will sing I shout Standing on the promises of God Standing, standing Standing on the promises of Christ my Savior Promises, not covenant And all the promises of God are in Him they are not in you. They are in him. Yes and amen. Fulfilled, fulfilled in Christ. You don't have to do anything for God to do what he wants to do for you. God does not need you to do what he has committed himself to do. That is why you didn't pray for Jesus to die. You didn't fast for Jesus to rise. Did you pray for Jesus to die? Did you fast for Jesus to rise? Before you were born, he died. Before you were born, he rose. Before you were born, he gave you victory. Glory to God. Somebody shout, I hear you. Am I teaching good? Some say, no, I have to fast. If I don't fast, the breakthrough will not come. Look at your little head. You didn't fast for Christ to die. You didn't fast for Christ to rise. Is it Kai you're fasting for? You're fasting for money? Christ and money, which is more expensive. Did you fast for Christ? How did you get Christ? Free. So why must you fast for car? Yet the car you're fasting for, a man without Christ is buying two without fasting. <laughs> He's buying two without fasting. Isn't that a slap on your fasting? <laughs> your fasting, you can't get second new one. A man without fasting is buying brand new two. Tear rubber. Something is not right with your understanding. I dare them record. They have a zeal of God but not according to knowledge. Am I teaching good tonight? Yes. Romans chapter, chapter, chapter 10 verse 5 says, I mean 8 verse 5 says, God commended his love toward us. In that while we were yet, Christ, does a sinner pray for Christ to die? So if God spared not his son, but gave him up for us all. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Somebody shout, I have Christ. I have everything. 
tell your neighbor I need nothing all I need is in Christ Christ in me the hope of glory I thought somebody would shout glory where is Christ where is Christ I'm looking for Christ where is Christ where is Christ tell somebody if you're looking for Christ don't look too far just look at me he's in me <laughs> glory to God somebody shout glory okay sit down give me a few minutes let me push this home so the law first covenant man's covenant cannot disannul is it clear so God does not have two covenants which means in God there is no old and new covenant in God there is only what the promise which is now wait 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 first pastor promise second pastor man's covenant third pastor new covenant God doesn't have two covenants God has only one covenant which is what promise man's covenant God said I will make a new covenant this is not God this is God so God is what new covenant God is what which means new covenant started before old covenant which is first covenant now this is where we have the lacuna and we're going to fix it the question now is who is responsible for the man's covenant John 1 17 you will soon see that man of God Pastor James says you travel from very far that means you have stamina that's what I'm keeping stamina let's all read together everybody very loud clean clear one two go for the law was given by who so who gave man's covenant then read the next line but 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 grace and truth came by where is truth in grace or in law so there's no truth in law There is only truth in grace. There's no truth in law. Is there truth in law? <laughs> Where is truth? In grace. I am the way. There is no truth in law. <laughs> <laughs> this is serious. This is bull's eye, right? <laughs> Law preachers now will be looking for big, big stones to stone me. But their stone cannot find me. There is no truth in law. For by the law shall no man be justified. What cannot justify you is not profitable. grace actually the original says but grace which is the truth it's not two things it's not grace and truth as a conjunction but grace and truth as capulative which means the k-a-i rule of bible interpretation which is explanatory grace which is the truth the original says exists as christ it's not came as as grace and truth came 
came? No. It's not came like walking to a place. It's exist. Exist as Christ. So Christ is grace. Christ is truth. Grace which is truth. So when you are preaching grace, you are preaching truth. You are preaching Christ. When you are preaching law, you are not preaching Christ. You are not preaching truth. Law cannot save. Law cannot save. And let me tell you something. If you sit under a law preacher, you will die and keep dying. Because there is no life in the law. Life is in truth. I am the way, the truth, and the... So life can only be found in the truth, not in the law. The later kill it, that's the law. The spirit given life, which is Christ. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set me free from the law of sin and death. So in the law there is sin and death. In Christ there is life. Am I teaching good? So <laughs> we're settling now. First or man's covenant or law given by Moses. Who did Moses give the law to? To the fathers. Fathers. The covenant I made with your fathers. <laughs> when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt, who took them by the hand? Moses. So the eye was Moses, not God. So somebody said to me, who gave Moses the laws? Moses himself. Some say, is it not by God's permission? No. God did not permit Moses to give the law to the children of Israel. Once you say God permitted, it means God has a hand. So, so, somebody will say, so how did Moses have so much power? So much power, you can see it. So much power to give such a law that the Bible will record. Because in Exodus 19... Verse 4, 5, and 6. Look at it. Put it up. Exodus 19, 4, 5, and 6. I'll soon let you go. Exodus 19, 4, 5, and 6. Exodus. Exodus is somewhere after Revelation. <laughs> I'm just joking. <laughs> I'm trying to make his work harder. <laughs> but he's outsmarted me. You have seen what I did unto the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you unto myself. Look at the next verse. I love Jesus. I love God, I'm telling you. Now, therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then you shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. Look at the next verse. Next verse, 6. Can we all read together? Everybody want to go? And you shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and an holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. God told Moses, go and tell Israel. I want to talk with all of you as my children face to face. I want to talk to everybody one by one. Go and tell them to come. I want to make all of them a kingdom of priests. A priest is one that can access God. I want to make them a holy nation. Holy means set apart. Holy does not mean sinless. <laughs> I hope you 
hope I'm not getting into trouble in Mombasa. <laughs> Holy does not mean sinless. Because many of you, when we say holy, you're thinking of no sin. Uh -uh. The word holy means set apart. They took you out and set you apart. That's why plates were called holy. Animals were called holy. Even land was called holy. The ground where you stand is holy ground. What is holy about the ground? <laughs> what is holy about animals? Other than that they have been set apart. That's why I say you are a holy nation. Called out of darkness into his marvelous light. So God said, I want to make all of you a holy nation. Meaning, I want to set you apart for myself. You know what Israel said? They said to God, we don't want to talk to you. If you get to read the whole chapter, you see it. They say, Moses, tell God, we don't want to talk to him. Go and tell him. Tell him that we are sent. Say he sent you to us. He sent you. You too, we are sending you to him. Go and tell God. Anything he wants to tell us, he should tell you. You will tell us. So they appointed Moses their boss. And God does not force people. So since all of them say, Moses, be our boss. By the authority of the office they gave him, he gave them laws. And God honored the laws. Because the people gave him the authority to give them the laws. Am I teaching? That's why it is called the law of Moses. Now, listen carefully. There is a difference between the law of Moses and the Ten Commandments. They are not the same. They are not the same. If you read the Ten Commandments, they don't have a curse. No curse in the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not do this, thou shalt not do that, thou shalt not do that. Case closed. Nothing like if you don't do it, I will. Uh, it's just you shall not do this, you shall not do this. Honor your father and mother, for this is the first commandment with a promise. No curse. But the law of Moses has curses. You do this, I bless you. You don't do it, I curse you. In fact, in Deuteronomy 28, Moses said, All the curses that are in the book and the ones that are not in the book shall come upon you. Then Moses now said to them, And the people shall say, and all of them shouted, Amen. <laughs> Moses will curse them. After cursing them, he will say, and all the people shall say, and they will answer, Amen. Go ahead, read it. It's there in the Bible. He cursed them, and they consented. So because they consented, they submitted their power to Moses and the angels to execute quick judgment on anyone that didn't obey what they committed themselves to do. That's why... I think I can let you go now. God bless you, man. Thank you. Thank you. Clap for him. Clap for him. That's why. For if the word spoken by angels. Hey, what are you guys doing to me, Mombasa? I'm teaching you a lot of things in one night. I'm pushing a lot of stuff. Pastor Jane, don't be jealous. Nairobi, different stuff. Nakuru, different stuff. No reputation. Every, every people have their own food. Look at this. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 2. Are you, still, are you tired? Are you still here? Hebrews chapter 2, verse 2. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 2, brother. Can we all read together? Everybody very loud want to go. For if the word spoken by what? By what? Was. Was. Was the meaning of steadfast. Consistent. Okay. And can we go? Every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward. 
So this is one dispensation. Angels. Next verse. Verse 3. How shall we escape? Now hold it. Escape what? Context. Context. Let me give you expo. Context. 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 Okay, so let me ask again. How shall we escape what? Huh? Yes, how shall we escape the words spoken by angels that are disobedience? How shall we escape these words in verse 2? If we what? Neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by what? The Lord. And was confirmed unto us by them that heard him. So there is a salvation of the Lord. Salvation in Christ. The salvation in Christ is your escape from the law. You didn't see it. Let me let me let me backtrack. Let me backtrack. For if the words spoken by angels was steadfast, and every disobedience and transgression received a just recompense of reward, how shall we escape? from angels and judgment and curses if we neglect the salvation that Jesus brought the law was given huh? by Moses grace which is truth exists as Jesus words spoken by angels we escape it by the salvation of Christ so listen if you can escape the word spoken by angels by Jesus, it means it was not Jesus that gave the angels the words to speak. <laughs> because Jesus cannot give the word spoken and make you escape it. Is it getting clear? Which means the word spoken by angels was Moses. The, listen carefully. The angels were the supernatural arm of Moses' ministry. It was the angels that were carrying out activities. Supernatural activities. So if you misbehave and disobey Moses, it is angels that will make sure you have a punishment that cannot be explained in natural instances. Because Moses and the angels worked together when man gave Moses the authority to decide for them. Then Jesus came as the escape from Moses and the law and the angels. But if you neglect Jesus, then Moses and the law and the angels will take care of you. But once you receive Jesus, Moses, the law, and the angels have no business with you. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision availeth anything but faith which worketh by love. Are you understanding? The law is a man's covenant. You and God don't have a covenant. God and God are in covenant. God and God. Immortal and immortal. Because two of them cannot default. So by two immutable things, it's impossible for God to lie. Two. God, God. Christ God. The Lord said to my Lord. Adonai said to Yahweh. So Yahweh and Adonai in a covenant. And because two of them are immortal, the covenant cannot be broken. Then man is a product of the covenant. Your mother and father have a covenant, not you. 
you are a fruit of their covenant you are a beneficiary so since your mother and father agreed to produce you they must give you food they must give you clothes they must give you a house they must pay your fees they must give you water to drink you are their responsibility you didn't ask to be a son of God God and God agreed that we will produce children as many as receive him to them give him power to become the sons of God so since God has produced you as his child it is his responsibility to provide for you to take care of you to look after you my God shall supply according to his riches are you getting blessed tonight you are just a beneficiary are you understanding hebrews 9 16 as i close we have tomorrow afternoon we have tomorrow night god punish the devil hebrews 9 16 i want us to read together everybody are you getting blessed hebrews 9 16 hebrews can we read together for where a testament is there must also of necessity be the death of the testator next verse next verse for a testament is of force after men are dead otherwise it is of no strength at all while the testator liveth Pastor Jane, I'm feeling like I'm in Uyo because I'm hearing some noise. <laughs> Where the testator is alive, the testament has no power. It is the death of the testator that powers the testament. If your father wrote a will, your father wrote a will wrote a will and gave you 15 of his houses in Nairobi eh? and his oil well in Nigeria you cannot possess that will till your father dies except you are a witch even if you are a witch the court of law does not understand witchcraft <laughs> you are the only one that is thinking of witches the legal system doesn't know about witches And let me shock all of you. Witchcraft is the lowest realm of satanic activity. The lowest, 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 lowest. Satan does not even recognize them. That's how low they are. Can I shock you a little more? Witchcraft is not a spirit. Go and read your Bible. Witchcraft. Okay, let me show you what witchcraft is. Can I show you what witchcraft is? You want to know what witchcraft is? Galatians 5.19. We will come back to testator. Galatians 5.19. Gale, gale, gale. Galatians 5.19. Galatians, brother, is somewhere around... Matthew. Don't mind me, I'm just joking. Can we all read together, everybody? Galatians 5 19, want to go. Now, the works of the flesh, what is it called? What is it called? Okay, are uh, manifest. Which are these? Let's read, want to go? Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness. Next verse 20. Idolatry. next one so hatred and witchcraft are in the same department 
You are the only one that has given them a high cheer. Somebody that is in hatred. Somebody that is in jealousy. Him and witches are in the same class. Witchcraft is not a spirit. Witchcraft is a work of the flesh. So those of you that have been seeing things flying, go and clean your head. Nothing is flying. It is flying inside your head. Somebody said to me, Sorry, Dr. Damina. Dr. Damina is just, he doesn't understand the gospel. How can he say there is nothing like spiritual warfare? I never said, I have never said that there is nothing like spiritual warfare. But I said, spiritual warfare is not what you think. Spiritual warfare is what I am doing now. As I'm teaching you, I am in warfare against your mindset. And I'm bringing things down by revelation. Warfare is not against Satan. It's against mindsets. We don't fight Satan. If you fight Satan, you will never win. Because the fight does not exist. <laughs> it's like looking for what is not in existence. Will you find? If you keep looking for what does not exist, you will never find. So that's why if you fight Satan, you will keep fighting till you die. Because that fight does not exist. Why? Jesus finished it 2,000 years ago. Yeah. Having spoiled principalities and powers. Jesus spoiled them. So witchcraft is a work of the flesh. Simple Bible teaching will take care of it. Because witchcraft is the act of domination, manipulation, and intimidation. When you bully people, that's witchcraft. When you intimidate people, that's witchcraft because you are making them do what they don't want to do. When you make somebody do what he doesn't want to do, that's witchcraft. And it is done by the, an act of intimidation, domination, okay, or manipulation. You know, sometimes your children practice witchcraft on you. Children. Mommy, I want Coca-Cola. No, you cannot have Coca-Cola today, Juno. You cannot, I have told you. Ooh, he starts crying. He falls down. He rolls on the floor. That's manipulation. That's witchcraft. <laughs> Juno is practicing witchcraft. <laughs> when you take a cane and you give him, where, where? This, the witchcraft will disappear. <laughs> because it is a work of the flesh. I'm teaching good. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the gods are dead. They are dead. The man in Christ is superior. He's a product of the new covenant. So watch this. Where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. For a testament is only of force after men are dead. While the testator liveth, the testament is of no force. So Jesus wrote the new covenant. The inheritance, salvation, the blessing, righteousness, justification, holiness, acceptance then he died after he wrote he died so he can qualify you to possess it but listen to where the difference is the covenant that God made concerning us with himself is not the testament of a dead man
in the natural it is when the man is dead you can take his inheritance in the plan of God the death of Jesus empowered you to take the covenant to take the benefits but he rose so he's no more dead he didn't rise to stop you from the inheritance he rose to defend the inheritance so you can enjoy it Did you understand what I said? Because when you write a will, you give to a lawyer. In case somebody wants to contend, the lawyer will defend the will. In this case, Jesus could not trust anybody with what he did with his death, burial, and resurrection. So he rose and became the advocate of the will. So the devil tell you you cannot be healed, tell him too late. I'm not looking for healing. Too late. I'm not the sick trying to be healed. I am the healed. I'm not the poor trying to be rich. I am the rich. I'm not a sinner saved by grace. I am saved. I am not trying to be righteous. I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Where are the righteous people? Get on your feet and shout glory. Shout glory. Say with me very loud, I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Say it again, I am a beneficiary of the inheritance of God's promise. I am accepted in the beloved. I am in authority. I'm not a victim. I'm a victor. I am more than a conqueror. I didn't hear powerful amen. Are you blessed tonight? Well, go ahead and celebrate the word of God tonight. Glory! 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 Say, I am in the new covenant. A beneficiary of the promise of God. Fulfilled by Christ. Say, I'm not in need. All my needs have been supplied in Christ. Christ in me right now. I didn't hear a good amen. Wait, stand with me everybody. Stand with me. My God shall supply according where? According where? Riches where? In glory? Glory where? In Christ. God supplies how many? All my what? According? Riches where? Glory where? Christ where? That's a song. That's a song, Leo. That's a song, Leo. <laughs> God supplies according? Riches where? Glory where? Christ where? Now, now, hold on. Ah, yeah, yeah. I want to pray for you, but I want to show you something so you can take that prayer. A fish, I hope that brother has not. <laughs> I hope you have not left the computer. I was preaching somewhere, and I was just saying, Brother, put it up. Brother, put it up. In, 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 in. In, in America, Indiana, Indiana, when I went to Indiana, I was going to say, brother, put up that scripture, brother, put up that scripture, brother, because I assume it's always brothers. So after the service, a lady just walked up to me and said, thank you, pastor, for the word. I said, oh, praise God. She said, I am that brother. <laughs> for the first time, I got to say, oh, so a sister can also do so I have to be careful. I don't know if it's a brother or sister. <laughs> That's a brother. Okay. <laughs> Philip, Ephesians chapter 1 verse 17. Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 1. You know, I come to Mombasa once, once in many, many years. <laughs> My first time. <laughs> okay. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, everybody read together with me very loud. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation where? In the knowledge of him. Next verse. The eye next verse 18 the eyes of your being now read, read very well
uh, that you may what is the hope of his now the next one and what go back go back go back to verse 18 go back to verse 18 good and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance stop the riches of the glory of his inheritance my god shall supply all your needs according to the riches of his glory the riches of the glory of his inheritance we are in the saints so if god will supply your needs according to his riches in glory where is the riches of the glory of his inheritance inside you that means everything that god needs to supply your needs is where inside you god is not meeting your needs from heaven it's inside Everything you need in this life is inside you right now. You've been looking for, for it to come elsewhere because not knowing it's here. My needs are met according riches in glory in Christ. So the supply, the supply to your needs is where? In you. Stop looking for people that will help you. Help is inside. Pull it out. Did you hear what I said? Pull it out. Pull it out. How do you pull it out? Out of the abundance, the mouth, and you shall have what you you pull it out by speaking. You pull out the riches of his glory by speaking. And when it goes out, it arranges people, arranges circumstances, arranges situations, and suddenly things are happening. There are some of you looking at me. This conference is the beginning of a new chapter for your life. New things, new doors, new opportunities opening up for you. If your amen is louder, receive it by grace. Lift your right hands, let me pray. Father, I pray for every man, every woman, every boy, every girl, every child. Everyone watching online, everyone watching in the house, everyone listening right now in the service. We rejoice that revelation knowledge is growing very big in Mombasa. The light is shining and darkness cannot comprehend. An army rising in this place that will manifest the glory of God in these last days. So I decree that the revelation of Jesus grows big on your inside until nothing else matters. In the name of Jesus. I declare that where you need a miracle this week, receive a miracle. Receive a miracle. I decree that barriers are terminated. I decree that the light of the gospel shines in your heart. Great days of manifestation. Great days of demonstration. Great days of the glory of God. They are upon you right now. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father. And I decree that Power City Mombasa goes from strength to strength. Men are coming to the light from the north, the west, the south, the eastern part of Mombasa. We call men out of darkness. We call men out of religion. We call men out of the shackles. We call men out of the dungeon. We call men out of darkness. In the name of Jesus. We command the hold on the minds of men broken. We command the light to shine. And we rejoice that the light gets stronger in this land until darkness has nowhere to hide. And everyone hearing the sound of my voice, great grace is upon you. I decree that all that God has done for you in Christ, you walk in the reality of them all. Thank you, Father, for the blessing. In Jesus' precious name. And every believer says a powerful amen. Go ahead and give God a praise. Go ahead. Give God a praise. Give God a praise. Is that how you praise God in Mombasa? Give God a praise. Somebody shout glory. Amen. Now listen to me. Grab an offering, everybody. We want to give in honor of the word of God. When you hear a word like this, this is one kind of word you hear. You don't want to walk out like that. You want to give an offering. You want to honor Christ. 
You want to honor the blessing that comes to the world. You want to give an offering, everybody. The banking details will be on the screen for those of you that want to do transfers. And if you're making out a check, make it out and leave it blank. I'm sure the team will know what to put on the check. But everybody, make sure you get a good offering tonight. We give in faith. We give in honor of Christ. Amen. Father, I pray for everybody giving those making transfers. Our hearts are stirred up. Our hearts are stirred up. We are willing in the day of your power. So I pray that as your people give tonight, the blessing is upon this house. Our giving is a sweet smell before you. And through our giving, the gospel reaches men who sit in darkness. And we give you praise. In Jesus' name we pray. And every believer says a powerful amen. amen. All right, the baskets are here. You can walk up, drop the baskets. The banking details are on the screen. You can also do your transfers. Let's give in faith right now. Before I answer questions, I'm going to answer questions and I'm going to make an announcement. But don't forget tomorrow, 12 noon, we're here for another session and 5 p.m. Then we will be through with Mombasa 2021 before we move to another place. Amen. Come drop your offerings. If you're making transfers, do them right now. And then while all of that is going on, I'll be ready for the questions. But, but Pastor Jane, I also came with books. I want to announce them quickly before I answer the questions. And I wanted to make sure you get as many as you can of these books. As many as you can. I have a book on curses, myth and the truth. Very powerful. Very, very powerful. All you need to know about curses. I have another one on the office of the pastor office of the pastor every child of god needs to get a copy of this because one of the call of god upon your life is to preach the gospel and pastor people there's another one on every man a minister very powerful it will help you to fulfill the call of god upon your life of course there's another one on the last days eschatology this will take care of his antichrist a man what about 5g what about 666 all of that whole thing this will help you a lot and many other books i mean you can get them they're all at the back do get make sure you get them and i'm sure tomorrow i'll take out some minutes to autograph some books god bless you please you can be seated once you drop your offerings and i'll be waiting for pastor jane to give us questions that are available Amen. Thank you, Papa. Thank you. Um, I'm going to request if you have any question that you'd like to ask Papa, please just write it on a piece of paper. And uh, there are some ushers who are walking around. Just give them your question written on paper and it will get here. We will read and Papa will be able to answer your question. Is that okay? Is that okay, church? Yes, write your questions. All those questions, it does not have to be related to the message that has been shared today, but all the questions that you have concerning doctrine, spiritual doctrine, uh, scriptural doctrine, please uh, just feel free to write the question. We'll, we'll try and answer as many as we can before we release you. Thank you. You may walk to the front to drop your offerings. Asante very important so you drop your offerings while people are writing questions and if you have your questions already written you can submit them the ushers are all over the place we love to answer them it's important you have all your questions cleared so that you live with clarity if there's any if there's no question you don't have to create one yeah if there's none but if there is we love to answer we give you two minutes if there are questions and if you remember questions tonight you can write them and bring them tomorrow we still want to answer more questions tomorrow praise God praise God okay there's a question there's another one okay very good and those paying by M-Pesa the M-Pesa details are on the screens the M-Pesa details are on Thank your you. screens questions 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 Sure. Uh, first question is with what you have explained please elaborate Ephesians 6 12 
weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down. Imagine. Wrestling not against flesh and blood, but against principalities. Is that what it is? Strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Ephesians 6.12, put it up. Brought down the computer. Now that I'm sure it's a brother. Brought down the computer. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 6 verse 12. 12. I have a book on it. I recommend that book for you. I'm going to just give you a teaser. You can get the book and read all of it. Um, there's a book at the back on Ephesians 6.12. Winning the war, winning the war. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual weakness in high places. He's talking about ministry. Ministry. Look at the previous verses. Start from verse 10. Always read the scripture in context, pretext, post text, context. Don't just pick a verse, read the, the context. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Next verse put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. He's talking about ministry. Ministry. All right, next verse for we wrestle not. The word wrestle there is not WWF. Because when you read wrestling, in your head, you are thinking of WWF. But the word wrestle there is not WWF. The word wrestle there means to resist. To put up a resistance. For we resist not flesh and blood. But our resistance is against principalities and powers. It's not like we're fighting. We're putting up a resistance. So because we are resisting the devil, the next verse he now says, put on, next verse 13. 13. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Next verse. Stand therefore. Then he now shows you what the armor is. Having your loins girt about with truth, having on the breastplate of righteousness next verse next verse and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace this is preaching so the wrestling here is preaching the gospel and when we preach the gospel, we wrestle with mindsets. It's the same thing he was talking about to Corinth when he says to them, casting down imagination, bringing down every thought under subjection to the obedience of Christ. It's the same thing he was talking about. It's the preaching of the gospel, not some, some mysterious fighting of the devil. It's the preaching of the gospel. And every time we preach the gospel, we are resisting Satan from the minds of men so they can see the light of Christ. Is it clear? Next, next question. Um, I want to uh, put this together. Can a man born of God sin one? Is it true that one saved is forever saved? After the work of the cross, is it right to call an unbeliever a sinner? First John chapter 2 verse 1 while we are reading the question. Is that all? Yes. First John chapter 2 verse 1. First John chapter 2 verse 1. My little children, these things write are unto you that you sin not. But, if any man sin, so a man that is born again can sin. He can sin. A man that doesn't have Christ is a sinner. A man that has Christ can sin. But it says, if any man sin, we have an advocate so the advocacy of jesus takes care of the sin of the believer is it true that once saved is always saved to answer you john 3 16 that whosoever believeth shall not perish but have everlasting life what is everlasting life 
Everlasting life means life everlasting. Life eternal. It means life without end. So if the life you receive from Jesus is without end, does it mean once saved, always saved? Huh? Yes. Yes. Once you are saved by Jesus, you are saved. Somebody says, can somebody lose salvation? How can you lose what you did not acquire? Salvation is not your work. Salvation is Christ's work. When Christ saves you, he keeps you. That's why it is eternal life. That means you and Christ are intertwined like scrambled eggs. You can never be lost. I can give you scriptures to read. John 10, 28 and 29. Romans chapter 8 verse 36 to 39. Hebrews 7, 25, 26. When you read them, they will help you. And then for detailed teaching, I have Soteria season 3. 35 hours of teaching on can a believer lose salvation with clear exegesis. You can order for that. But once Jesus saves you, you are saved. On fasting, can a Christian fast? Number one. Then the second question. Why should we not pray and fast? And Jesus advised his disciples that they should pray and fast. What do you call the first food you eat in the morning? Eh? Breakfast. Eh? Breakfast. Eh? breakfast so that means you fasted <laughs> that means who breaks fast who breaks a fast one who is fasting no no let's think who breaks a fast? So why do you break fast? Because from after you ate dinner, you fasted till morning. So when you woke up, you broke the fast. Whether you are a Christian or you are not a Christian, you are always fasting. Whether you know it or not. So to say a Christian should not fast is not even naturally right because you fast whether you plan or you don't plan so you can now decide to do the fasting intentionally so every night after dinner your fasting has started the only thing you add to it is prayer and bible study and it becomes a spiritual exercise who told you it must be six to six in the day what about six to six in the night is it not the same six to six six to six whether night or day. What is your problem? Are you not catching it? <laughs> are you understanding? Please, are you understanding? I'm not playing. I'm very serious. Every child of God fasts. Whether in the day. You know, your problem is religion is not good. Religion told you. That it is only fasting when it is 6 to 6 in the day. But do you know that you can fast 6 to 6 and you are busy with business. And it was not fasting but hunger strike. You were on hunger strike. What makes it fasting is that within the period of absence from food, you prayed, you studied, and you paid attention to hear God. You can do that at night when it is quiet and better than in the day when you are running around to meet appointments. Let me also add something. Some of you think that before it is fasting, it is when you don't eat food at all. But that's not true. You can eat food and you are fasting. Pastor Jim, you can eat food 
and you're fasting. In Daniel chapter 9, Daniel fasted for three weeks and he was eating. He was eating and the Bible called it fast. But he was eating complete food. Because Daniel said, I fasted three weeks. I did not eat pleasant bread. That means he was eating. But he made sure the food did not have pleasure. The pleasure out of the food is a fast. You can shut down your phone for three days to study. You fasted. But what you fasted was your phone. Do you understand? You can eat food without oil, without meat, without salt, and you are fasting. So there is no teaching against fasting, and there is no teaching for fasting. But fasting is self-discipline. So that you can focus. When you are feeling distracted from prayer, you take a fast to tame your body so you can pray. Fasting does not produce power. You shall receive power after you fast. What did he say? After do you have the Holy Ghost? So you have power. So why do we fast? For discipline. To tame our body. So we can gain focus. Is it clear? Um, how does one overcome past addictions as a born again believer? Addictions. How do you overcome addictions? Instead of worrying about the addiction, pursue to know Christ. Don't worry about the addiction. It's already there. <laughs> so don't worry. It's already there. Whether you worry or you don't worry, it's already there. So ignore it and seek Christ. Begin to eat the word of God. Eat the word of God. There's a level you will eat the word of God. It will change your appetite. And once your appetite changes, the addiction is gone. Listen. You don't push darkness out. If a room is full of darkness, you don't bring a broom to sweep it. You will walk out till you die. The darkness will be there. The way to drive darkness out is to turn the light on. The entrance of his world give it light. So receive light and addictions will escape. Is it clear? We all with open face beholding the glory of God as in a mirror. We are changed into that same image from glory to glory even as by the spirit of god is it clear i'll tie these three together is there anyone who entered heaven before the cross one is there anyone who entered heaven before the cross john Two. 3 13 john 3 13 while you're reading pastor j yes those who still practice the law of moses what happens to them when it comes to life after death okay john 3 13 first john chapter 3 verse can we all read together everybody want to go and no man hath ascended up to heaven but he that came down from heaven even the son of man which is in heaven so nobody went to heaven before the cross nobody this is jesus talking nobody where did enoch go he died where did Elijah go when the wild wind carried him? He died. Nobody went. People only went to heaven after Jesus rose from the dead. 
Is that clear? Are we clear? That's why they are called those who died in faith. Those who died in faith. On the day Jesus rose, he rose with all of them. They have all gone. The only people that are remaining now are those who died in Christ. There's a difference between those who died in faith and those who died in Christ. The dead in Christ shall be raised incorruptible on the day of rapture. Is it clear? Pastor Jane, did I answer all of it? Yeah. Um, those who still practice the law of Moses, what where happens? will they go? Mm. <laughs> If they have believed the gospel of Christ, they will be with Jesus with many losses. <laughs> they will be with Jesus with many losses. Because the law of Moses will deny you victory in life. The law of Moses will make you a hypocrite. You know why they say we preach grace, we give people license to sin? Because they, they are careful sinners. Their own. They are careful sinners. They are experts in sinning and hiding. When we preach grace, grace makes you to come out and stop pretending. Then when you come out, they will now be seeing your faults. Then they will say it is a license. But actually, grace is the cure. Because until a situation is diagnosed, you cannot treat it. So grace diagnoses your problem and brings cure on it. Is it clear? If you are a Christian and then converted to a Muslim, what happens? If you're a Christian who went into Islam, two things happen. Number one, you were never born again. You just entered inside church and started pretending. Bible calls them false brethren. There are false converts. And don't blame them. Many of them are in churches because the pastors did not preach Christ. When you go to church on Sunday morning and your pastor is teaching business, entrepreneurship, how to survive post COVID 19. And after that, he says, if you want to receive Christ, come out. Everybody that comes out is a false convert. Because those things that the pastor preach don't have the power to save a man. So there are many false converts in churches. And the problem is with the pastor. How can he be saved without a preacher? How can the preacher preach except he be sent? So what the preacher preaches will determine whether the man is a correct convert or a false one. That's the first reason why somebody will be in church. They gave him false hope. False hope. False hope. God will do it. God will do it. God will do it. After seven years, God didn't do it. He said, let me try Islam. It may be faster. He wasn't looking for Christ. He was looking for a miracle. The second one is, there are people that are truly born again, but they are not growing spiritually. So when pressures of life come on them, they now want to try other religions, even though they are born again. If the trumpet sounds, they will go to heaven with many losses, even though they went to another religion. They are suffering from identity crisis. It's like the boy who went to eat with pigs and his senses came back. If his senses didn't come back and he died, he would have still been a son. Because the day he came back, the father said, my son that is lost. He didn't say prodigal. It is you that call him prodigal. The father said, my son, which means once a son, always a son. Sonship is DNA. You can disown your child, but you cannot remove the DNA. Is it clear? Yes, so identity crisis could be the reason or the man was never saved. That's what Paul will say, what shall separate us 
from the love of God which is in Christ and he listed many things nakedness peril sword things present things to come principalities powers all of it he said I'm persuaded nothing in this life and nothing in the life to come shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ which means if you're seriously saved even if you went into consulting with sorcerers and doing all kinds of divination if you die you will still be with Jesus but with many losses is it clear the last one the last one Papa how could angels be under Moses's command could that lead them to be rejected by God like the same way he rejected those who obeyed the devil according to Hebrews 2 2 no they will not be rejected because angels were created for man they were not created for God God doesn't need angels man needs angels so since angels were created for man you can read it at home because of time Hebrews chapter 1 verse 14 first Corinthians chapter 6 verse 2 and 3 know ye not that we shall judge the angels why will we judge the angels not God because they were created for us so because they were created for man the angels took on the temperaments of the men they walked with that's why from when Jesus showed up angels stopped destruction because they took on the temperament of Christ under Elijah they destroyed because they were operating under the temperament of Elijah I mean can you imagine something like little children laughing at Elisha bald head bald head <laughs> Elijah got angry and commanded lions to eat up children and the lions came out and ate them up that is why the name of Elijah did not appear in the New Testament because he's not a model to copy <laughs> Pastor Jane his name is not in Hebrews 11 he's not an elder it's not an elder of it Elijah and Elisha they didn't appear in Hebrews 11 but Gideon appeared even Samson 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 was always carrying prostitutes everywhere he enters he will look for prostitute Samson was a celebrated womanizer yet he's an elder of faith Elisha bringing fire down and lions their name didn't appear you are not understanding. Do you know that even Solomon is not an elder of it? The wealth of Solomon is not an elder. You know what Jesus said about the wealth of Solomon? He said the lilies in the valley are richer than Solomon. Green grass is better than Solomon. That's what Jesus said. So people that are teaching the prosperity of Solomon they should go and read what Jesus said about Solomon's wealth. That even ordinary grass is better than Solomon. Are you understanding? Which means there is nothing in the wealth of Solomon to emulate. You know why? You know why? Let me destroy one table now. You know people tell you that. Because Solomon offered to God a thousand bond offering. God say anything you want I will give you that's not it's not like that it's not because Solomon gave God offering that God gave Solomon wealth think now Solomon was a king have you ever seen a king that is poor Solomon was a king of Israel number two all the wealth of David was transferred to Solomon he doesn't need to give God offering to be rich the man was already rich he was a king you're not hearing me think he was a king he had wealth 
It's not because he gave to God that he became wealthy. He was already a king. In fact, Solomon was an oppressor. What did I call him? That's why his children said they will oppress double their father. You know the story. Is it Jeroboam or Rehoboam? He said, our father, use Canaan, you will use Copion. That is, we will oppress you more than our father. He was an oppressor. The world system, you prosper by oppression. You prosper by oppression. Do you know this COVID-19 that people are dying and people are crying? There are people making money from it and they don't want it to stop. I hear another one has come out. Is it macaroni or what? Okay, or macro. I thought it's macaroni. <laughs> Because there are people making wealth. People are making money through COVID. You were on lockdown. But while you were on lockdown, people like Elon Musk under lockdown were making millions of dollars per second. Zoom was making millions of dollars per second because everybody was on Zoom. Netflix. You think they want COVID to go? The world system is oppression. Go and read. Abraham prospered by oppression. Father Abraham. Because that's the world system. That's why the Bible didn't ask you to emulate the wealth of Abraham. The Bible asks you to emulate his faith. Not his wealth. Is it clear? Follow the faith of Abraham. Not follow the wealth of Abraham. Because how did Abraham become wealthy? He took his wife and traded his wife in. And the man that took the wife was a wealthy man. So the man had to settle him. And Abraham did it two times. He was always using his wife as a bait to make money. Bad boy. That's why you don't copy the business of Abraham. You copy his faith. That's why there are elders who through faith. By faith they are elders. Not by business. Is it clear? Is it clear? Are you blessed tonight? Questions are clear? Answers are clear? Bless your heart. All right, love you guys. Tomorrow afternoon, we're here at 12 noon. Call some people, reach some people, invite some people. Tell them we're here live. It's not television, it's not social media. They should come and be blessed. And then tomorrow evening will be the final session. And tomorrow evening, I want to pray for all of you in attendance. I want to lay hands on you, speak God's word into your life, and impart some blessings into you. Are you excited about this? Praise God. Let's stand on our feet and celebrate as Pastor Jane takes over the microphone. Praise Jesus. Are we blessed? So like you've heard, we're meeting tomorrow. What time tomorrow? Tomorrow we have two sessions. We have uh, 12 to 2 p.m. And then second session is what time? 5 p.m. What's happening at 5 p.m.? Say impartation. Say impartation. So Papa is actually laying hands on all of us. Invite your friends to come along with you for the service. Go in peace in Jesus' name.